Hi everybody, I'm Eric Bolvin and welcome to Basic Horn Arranging. This is not just for horn players, any musician can, with some basic knowledge, crank out some simple horn parts, even guitarists and singers. But if you are a horn player and you want to be a commercial working, jobbing horn player around town, I think it's important to have some basic arranging skills. You get called on a gig, you know, you want to crank out a few charts, you got three horns. I think it's, uh, it's a pretty important thing to have in your toolbox. And you don't have to be the next Greg Adams or Jerry Hay. With some basic fundamentals, you can get right to writing some charts. Now, um, in this video, I'm going to talk about the five types of horn parts and play some examples for you. And then at the end, We'll talk about voicing. All right, let's get started. No matter what type of horn part you're writing, it is important to think of that part as a melody. Even a single punch should be looked at as melodic material, but the horn part should never uh, overpower the vocal. Whenever I, I find myself listening to Tower of Power or singing the songs, remembering them, and it's always the horn parts. I'm not singing the vocal parts. I'm singing the horn parts. That's how catchy those are. James Brown, his band used to tour without James Brown, just playing the riffs and without any vocal. So that's how strong those riffs are. Now, harmony can be your secret weapon when used in the right spot, complementing a musical uh, a unison line. I'll point that out in some of the upcoming examples. Okay, I'm going to talk about five types of horn parts that are common in commercial music. Certainly there will be exceptions. My guidelines here are basic so that you can write some simple arrangements. So these are not dogmatic rules and certainly exceptions will exist. All right, so first is intros, outros, and interludes, which in commercial horn music are usually in unison or octaves. Harmonized melodic lines that you find in jazz and big band writing is not that common in commercial music. So here are some examples of intros, outros, and interludes. So here's our first example of an introduction that's all unison octaves. What's interesting about Soul Man is that that lick is also used as the interlude and the outro with this chorus against it. Next up is Tower Power and Soul Vaccination. I mentioned earlier that harmony can be like a secret weapon. Well, here it is. This is all unison, except for two notes towards the end of it, he goes into harmony. It's brilliant. Here's a really famous interlude that's all in unison. This is Knock on Wood by Eddie Floor. Punches, stabs, or hits are often found in the choruses of songs and the verses. And these are uh, complement the vocal line and they are, they are often in harmony. So here's some examples of punches. So for the sake of time, I'm not playing the whole song, but you should go out and listen to these entire arrangements because in the next set, which is harmonized punches, the horns don't come in until the second verse or the second half of the verse. And this is really important. With the exception of riffs, you really don't want to be playing all the time. Here's Earth, Wind, and Fire, and some more Tower. Your dreams have all come true, just the way you planned. 
outer lines are just about always in unison and they usually appear in the chorus of commercial music. It's a tenet of arranging that if you have one section that's harmonized, for example, if you have a chorus and the vocals are, are in harmony, then the counterline against it needs to be in unison. You don't want two sections going against each other that are in harmony. Now you could do it, but it takes pretty good arranging skills to be able to pull it off. And listen to big band music too, because if you have a sax section that's in harmony and the brass section has a counterline, they would often be in unison or octaves. So here's some examples of counterlines. Here's a couple of famous counterlines, all in unison. Notice once again that they don't come in right away. The chorus is stated and then the counterline is added on the repeat. You shine star, no matter who you are. Shine bright to see what you can truly be. You shine star, no matter who you are. Shine bright to see what you can truly be. You shine star. I come to make it love to your old lady. Oh, you out making love, give it up. Guide tones and block chords are long tones that often back up a vocal or a solo. Here are some examples. So here's some block chord examples from Tower of Power. In the second example, so very hard to go, there's a lot of stuff going on. He's got block chords, he's got rhythmic punches, uh, all fully harmonized. And there's even some lines in there that are harmonized. And I said that's rare, but here it is. And, you know, he makes it work. It takes a lot of skill to do this type of arranging. The wrong decision will spoil all our dreams. Riffs are short repeated phrases that can back up a verse, chorus, or solo. Um, they can be in harmony or unison and or combinations. Uh, James Brown used riffs exclusively, so here's a couple examples. One of the questions I'm often asked is, how did you come up with that voicing? Well, certainly voicing is important and there's a lot to learn. However, you don't have to be Thad Jones to arrange for commercial horn sections. So I'm going to take you through a process that I've come up with that will lead you to the correct voicing for your horn section. We're going to do a hypothetical little part here that I've recorded. Okay, and basically it's just C7. Okay, and um, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to record just a little uh, horn punch on the top of it that goes like this. Okay, so here's the questions that we're going to ask. One, what chord is being played at the time of the punch? Well, for us it's C7. Now, that 
the function may have something you know to say here if if that c7 is a five of an f or the four of the g then things may be different for us right now we're just vamping on c7 that's the one chord that's it we're keeping things simple this is basic chord arranging all right what note is in the melody well We've decided that this G, this is the G on top of the stab, that's our melody note. Now remember that everything is a melody. And uh, so even like a little punch like that is treated as a melody. All right. Now, another thing to consider is do we want harmony on top of the melody? In this situation, we do not. So that's going to be the top note of our voicing. And the next question, number three, what is your instrumentation? Our hypothetical instrumentation is a trumpet, an alto sax, and a tenor sax. Then the next question is, what instrument is playing the melody? Well, the trumpet is the logical choice, so we're just going to go with that. And then the final question is, what chord do you want the horns to play? Well, our answer is simple, C7. Now, there are times when you might want to extend the chord for the horns. C9, C13. This takes a little more skill in arranging, and right now we're just doing basic chord arranging, so we're going to stick just with C7. So here's a quick review of our hypothetical situation. What chord is being played at the time of the punch? C7. What note is in the melody? G above the staff. What is your instrumentation? Three horns, trumpet, alto sax, tenor sax. What instrument is playing the melody? Trumpet. What chord do you want the horns to play? C7. So the next thing, and here's what it looks like on a chart, just our one note there. The next thing we have to do is figure out what notes we want the saxophones to play. Now we have the fifth of the chord, and the third and the seventh are the most functional notes of a chord. The third tells us, tells us if it's major or minor, and the seventh tells us what quality of seventh. So... We could put in the root, but that's the bass player's job. So we're going to go with the third and the seventh. And that would look like this. And now, let's hear what that sounds like. Tessitura is a word that really just means range in music. I use it to describe how a part is compared to the range of the instrument. For example, our note on the trumpet is concert G, that's his A on top of the staff. It's in the upper tessitura. It's a powerful note, that's a powerful tessitura for the trumpet. So I'm gonna be referring to tessitura here so we can compare how these instruments work together in the voicings. So we've just listened to example one here on the chart, and in the line below that, you can see what voicing we have. This is called a closed voicing. And we have the alto on the third and the tenor on the seventh below him. Next to that, we see the actual notes as played on the instrument. And this is important. It's important to note that the saxophones are playing in a higher tessitura than the trumpet is. And I don't think it sounds bad particularly. It sounds good. And closed voicings are very useful. However, to get the most out of your instruments, you want them to be in a strong tessitura. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up this voicing using a technique called drop two. So looking at example two here, you can see that I've taken the third of the chord, the E, and lowered it one octave. This is drop two voicing. And what it gives us is an open voicing, as you can see in the line below. And the actual notes, now the trumpets, he's still on A, but the alto's on G and the tenor on F sharp. So we are all in the same tessitura. So let's see what this sounds like. So what do you like better? Well, they both sound pretty good. I think the... Open voicing is a little fatter, a little thicker. I think over the course of a tune, and certainly over the course of an entire set, you're going to prefer the uh, open voicing to the closed voicing. Also keep in mind, 
that horns have intonation problems when you get to the extreme tessitoras, either lower or higher. All right, but let's listen to them back to back and see what we think. So closed voicings are also very useful, especially if the trumpet in our little section is is lower. So here in example three, I've taken the trumpet and put him down an octave. <clears throat> in fact, everybody's down an octave. Sorry, I have bronchitis. And uh, so what we get is everybody's pretty close in their tessitura. And uh, really, you're not left with many choices here when the trumpet is that low. So... Let's see what that sounds like. And in addition, sometimes when you have more melodic type lines, like an extreme example would be Brecker Brothers, like Skunk Funk, where the trumpet is playing a line, everybody's playing this line in, in harmony, and you've got, let's say, the trumpet playing an A, and then below him, the alto on F sharp, and, and then the tenor on an E in whole steps. So everybody's really close together. And it works in that situation. So in jazz and, and more melodic stuff, close voicings tend to be more useful. Okay, everybody, if you stuck around this long, you get the reward. And that's to see Stevie. Here he is. He was in the first video. That was like 13 years ago. I, I look a lot older. He, you know, he looks the same, except he's kind of sleepy and not very cooperative right now. But here he is. He's 15 years old. All right. I hope you enjoyed the horn video, and uh, there may be uh, some more advanced stuff coming, depending on the response. So uh, go out, write some charts, play them, listen, and uh, make up your own mind on what you like. All right. Good luck. <laughs>